This is Stephen Platinum, your friend in wrestling with Platinum vs. Monday Night Raw from um, October 5th, 2020. We're still at the Amway Center in Orlando, though supposedly not for much longer. Uh, Tom Phillips is there, Byron Saxton is there, and Samoa Joe is there. Thank Buddha. <laughs> it's just the best team that they have. Um, and Samoa Joe, as a side note, was working overtime to put stuff over. And there was a lot of really bad stuff to put over. Um, Randy Orton is there. Of course, they have to have a discussion about him beating up the legends in an infamously bad segment. But you have to acknowledge it, I suppose. So bad. So bad. Um, he talks about how the legends panicked, but apparently made no, no noise while they were panicking. Um, Drew shows up, which doesn't seem to make sense if you're careful, Randy Horton, that you would leave a way to, for Drew to get at you right away. Um, no steel chair action happens, but a little punchy punch, and then officials quickly come and separate. Though they weren't there quick last time. Oh well. Um, we got Selena Vega, Lana, and Natalia taking on baby faces. Asuka, um, La I'm sorry, Dana Brooke, and uh, Mandy Rose. Mandy Rose looks great, um, but not in the ring. They all look like dippity do dog shit. Selena Vega is not as bad as the most of the others, and then Oscar's there to try to carry this whole thing. It's really god awful. It's actually worth looking at because it was a time very um, not that long ago where WWE Raw had the best women by far, but now you've got Bailey and Sasha. Um, doing their thing exclusively with the two of them, so that takes them kind of out of the mix, except for their stuff. And uh, Charlotte's not there, Kari Sane is not there, so now you just have Asuka carrying this horrible women's division. I mean, seriously, they went from easily the best to, I would say, on AEW level, with Asuka being slightly better. I mean, it's that bad. Yes, and that was a slight diss at AEW, which people would know if you listen, um, that I love. But, I mean, their women's division and the way they book it is horrible. But the women's division, the fact that WWE is only slightly ahead at this point as far as women's division goes tells you a lot. Man, is it bad. We get a promo for the draft, which I guess is going to begin this Friday. I'll be my like, the way that everything is presented, everything feels like a, a, a dodge and hustle, even when it's not. We have 24-7 stuff, Drew Gulak, we've got Akira Tozawa, it's, it's what it is. Um, our truth gets out of there with the title. Do we need to know anything else? I don't think so. Mustafa Ali, Ricochet, and Apollo Crews, and Hurt Business stuff. There's a bunch of Gaga um, promos, and it's all going to kind of come to naught by the finish, which I actually wouldn't hate under normal circumstances, but it is what it is. Seth Rollins and Murphy against Dominic Mysterio and Humberto. Man, I mean, these are all angles that have been going on for months. It feels like years. We're talking four months for this, like, Hurt Business angle. With Apollo Crews and company, and then all this stuff with... Man, it's just bad. And they're having to pay stuff off and shift gears because it's all not working. Uh, which is not what you want with angles that you've been tied up with for a third of the year. Uh, Murphy and Seth Rollins manages to win this. So... Because, I mean, come on. What else is Humberto there for? Humberto, who loves the Mysterio family, but then has nothing to do with them for a while, and then they bring him back to take a pin. It's just, it's very transparent. Um, oof. And I just thought of something. Um, because the viewership on Raw tends to skew older, strangely, I think that's part of the reason they can get away with the sort of slipshod booking, because the older fans are just used to it. 
Whereas younger fans that would tune in would just go, I don't really know what's going on. And it, I, the word I would use for WWE Raw right now is uninspired, even when they're trying to do things. I mean, we don't have Raw Underground, right? Which we find out, again, Adam Pierce is there and Strowman, I want a match. And um, Keith Lee says, I'll fight him. And okay. Uh, part of this is it's a baby face problem. In my uh, full disclosure, I talk about how John Moxley is the natural choice for number one. Because uh, who else are you going to put there? If you're going to, what what champion can you put up from the WWE that would be worthy? And there there isn't one. I mean, the fact that Adam Cole is three and he's won it before and he's just on NXT tells you how slipshod the booking is. The WWE's idea of a babyface are the biggest, toughest guys on their roster who they have to end up looking like fools because that's how faces get booked is they just, they're tricked and they're stupid even though they're bigger and stronger and conceivably just as smart they continually get upended by heels. That's the only way that they know how to book some semblance of heat nowadays on WWE. Uh, so we got Kevin Owens for a KO show. He's going to have Bray Wyatt. Oh boy. Um, Seth Rollins, Murphy, they mad, bro. Um, Drew McIntyre is going to get an interview later tonight in response to Randy Orton. What? Okay. Why wouldn't he have responded? Whatever. Um, all right. And so we've got Alexa Bliss talking to Kevin Owens, doing the best she can acting in this dreadful shit. Um, so Kevin Owens throws all his stuff out. So we show the KO segment with Alexa Bliss from SmackDown, um, where Fiend put Owens down. He's really putting over the mandible claw. He's doing what he can, but again, working with the Fiend is damn near impossible. It's just tough, because you know it's going to pay off in a match that's not good. Seriously, name me a Fiend match that was good. All you can do is name me Fiend matches that were amongst the worst ever, and completely destroyed the people that he was involved with. All baby faces, by the way, that he ruined. Um, John Cena did did his did him the honors because he was walking out of the door. Um, Seth Rollins is it was the worst match of the year in that Hell in the Cell, and it forced Seth Rollins to become now a lower mid card heel. Think about that. Um, and then Braun Strowman, they had to write him off the brands, and now they're just stuck putting him in Haas matches with Keith Lee. Yeah. So, um, we got Firefly Funhouse stuff. I gotta say this about Firefly Funhouse, and it drives me fucking nuts. The puppetry is shit. You seriously can't get somebody to lip sync properly? And if you don't know what that means, then um, guess what? Neither do the people who are doing the puppets. It's awful. You can't stick somebody down there to do like decent puppetry where they open the mouth when they're supposed to match the verbals. God, it's embarrassing. Just a tribute or an homage is a thing done well, which is something the WWE does not understand. It's why their comedy vignettes don't come across well, because they're not funny. And the Firefly Funhouse, which is this great concept, if they would do the puppets well, then it would make everything that much better. But again, they don't care about that, because to them it's not a detail that makes money, but in the long run, it really does. People want to know that you're the best. And the worst thing that's happened to the WWE in the years since AEW has been open is they can claim any number of things numerically, but there's the feeling that AEW is this far superior show in many ways. And if you think that isn't harmful, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. Doing things well 
um, and worrying about the details. And they don't have the staff. I mean, I have friends that work there who tell me like they're running around with their chickens with their heads cut off and they don't know who to go to to get answers. And it's way rougher behind the scenes at WWE than even the people like Meltzer or Disco or Conan or Jim Cornette even know. And I know because I'm, I'm you know, on the ground level and I'm here in Florida. All right. Wyatt does a good job of sort of snapping into that thing when he talks about The Fiend. Like, the per that performance part is fine. Right? And then Owens gets attacked by Alistair Black. We go to commercial, and we don't see anything, any effects of any of that stuff. Yeah. Typical, you know? It's like commercials happen, and it just erases the board, and they start over. There's no sense of continuity. There's no sense of organic spontaneity. Um, which is a big part of doing a wrestling show is you want it to feel organic. And WWE has given up on that in the notion of sort of marching forward and just trying to put together a show. They're so busy just doing their job that they aren't like, they're, they're so busy trying to keep the gig that they're not doing the job, which is doing the job is producing a show that feels like the coolest thing that you could be watching right now. And they've given that up in, in the favor of workmen like marching forward to the next thing. It's about checking boxes off a list, which often they fail to do, instead of creating some semblance of magic. Um, there's nothing magical about this show. Unless you create it and, and are looking hard to try to find it. But there's nothing that jumps out at you about this is good, right? Hell in the Cell has been rendered to nothing. Randy Orton and Drew talks about we're going to do Hell in the Cell. So what? It's just a cage match now, right? So we're looking at Braun Strowman's dominance. Um, and then we're going to have an exhibition match. What the fuck does that mean? Way to diminish everything. It will not count to any one loss records. Well, what the fuck does that matter if they're just going to do a count out, which is right at what I write in my notes? And guess what? Count out. Bianca Belair, she's doing a trivia thing. She's too smart for them. Okay. Um, I mean, these vignettes are great for her, but what's the plan with her once she wrestles? They need her, by the way. Um, Drew Gulak, Dumpster Stuff, Truth has the title. Great. Um, Hurt Business. We're going to be back with them. They talk about retribution. Yay, tipping the hand. Ricochet, Mustafa Ali, and Apollo Crews come. They're all fight in, fight in, doing their thing. Lashley um, gets Crews, oh my god, to tap out again. So they win. And um, the Hurt Business stand tall. And um, Ricochet barks, telling the Hurt Business that they're going to keep fighting, which sounds <laughs> like the most horrible promise ever, if you're a fan. Murphy sees Aliyah Mysterio. Their drama continues. Murphy's got 12 minutes to apologize. Okay. I do like that they do ticking clock stuff. It does give a sense of urgency to the show. It gives us a reason to tune in later. But again, they don't have the infrastructure of a good show to support that idea. It's a, it's a good idea that's not supported by a show that can accentuate what they're trying to do, if that makes sense. And again, I know it sounds like I just bag on Raw, but it's a bad show. Um, I mean, it's so bad that I'm thinking, like, is SmackDown now the cornerstone show and do i need to watch that instead of raw there's no way i can do both there's just no way um it feels like i'm doing this for posterity but i like that raw is so bad because there's so many teachable moments in it and i hope you're listening to this because you get that out of it as well 
Um, we get another promo for the draft. It's on SmackDown and next Monday's Raw. Okay. Shelton, Benjamin, all kinds of stuff. They're yelling. Um, okay. Rollins addresses Murphy and says he will wait to his apology. Murphy. Um, uh, they keep harping on this. You gotta apologize thing. I'm yelling at you. Apologize. Then they brawl. They brawl. Um, Rollins is going for his eyes. Rollins gets the kendo stick. And again, you know, it's just in this world, there's just kendo sticks underneath the ring. Okay. Um, Rollins um, grabs the chair. Aaliyah tells him to stop. The Mysterios come out. Again, is Seth Rollins so... They're not afraid of Seth Rollins to the point where the wife comes out, the daughter's out there. Like, there's no sense of danger in any of this. Maybe Retribution will attack. No, we know it's not. Nothing on Raw feels connected or dangerous or spontaneous or organic. And it's proved by what they let happen. Right? If I if I work for WWE, am I bringing my kids around um, with Retribution running around destroying stuff and Seth Rollins, who's you know in the past pulled an eyeball out and but and shown that he has no compunction about doing the worst stuff ever, but they're not afraid. They're not. They don't act afraid. They're not booked to be afraid of anything for the sake of a soap opera angle. And I have no problem with the soap opera angle part. I just want it to make sense. Because it will... That's the thing. Good writing and filling in details and doing stuff like making sure the puppeteering is good in Firefly Funhouse, all of these things compound. It's, it's creating momentum. And right now, Raw, they're having to fight against themselves and dig themselves out of holes constantly instead of really taking you to a place where you can suspend disbelief and you stop and you get past the intellectual defenses that a person will naturally have when you're watching a bad show they it's in con in in the con world where people are conning each other they call it putting you under the ether meaning putting you in a state where you're thinking emotionally instead of rationally that's how they get your money con men and they get you to do what they want because you know bernie madoff when he's stealing people's money, people are like, how can they be so stupid? Because he because he has their trust, right? Because he's an old Jew and they're Jewish. And he, and he uses whatever emotional bonds he can to get around their intellectual defenses. And then he gets them to think about, like, imagine what you could do for your family tree and what you could give your grandkids if you took this, you know, you gave me 50000 and I give you an additional 50000 for it. Like, it's not rational that that would happen, but he gets people thinking of the possibilities instead of the danger. And WWE has not gotten us to the point where we stop thinking intellectually. They just are incapable of doing it on Raw. And this next match epitomizes it. The Riot Squad against Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler. Do Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler not trust each other, or do they trust each other? Because they go back and forth. The only good performer in this thing is Shayna Baszler, and she locks in that choke, and Ruby Riot sells it as good as she can, but everything isn't as good as it could be. And the only time I'm taking swept up in the moment is when Nia Jax is doing anything to anybody, because I'm concerned that she's going to fuck it up. Because everything is sloppy. But that's not what they're going for, right? Um, Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax win. Baszler refuses to let go of the hold, but lives. She's upset. Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax are dominant. Street Profit. They're gonna be on a team with Drew McIntyre. MVP versus Mustafa Ali. Retribution attacks the Hurt Business. Mustafa Ali is the leader of Retribution. This should close the show. This is my main problem with this. Mustafa Ali being leader, it's whatever. At this point, you can't really fuck up Retribution. It can only help, and it can only help Mustafa Ali, at least in the short term, so I'm all for it. But this doesn't close the show, the big reveal. All right. 
Drew McIntyre and the Street Profits against Randy Orton and Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler. The long and short of it is Randy Orton pins Drew McIntyre. Wow. Wow. And that is Platinum versus Raw. A lot of lessons chocked full in this one. And uh, that's the role I have. And um, thank you for listening. And check out my sponsor, yo, um, Raz Energy Drinks. It'll be there in the description. I'm very excited about having a sponsor. And it's thanks to you good people who listen. And feel free to comment and like and all that good stuff as well. Appreciate you.